Hey everyone, I'm Frenzy the Killbot. Welcome back to Kerbal Space Program and our mission to Drez. Here you can see our three phases as they get closer and closer to their destination. Uh, I did the course correction burns off screen uh, because it turns out that a bunch of minute long burns out in deep space uh, really aren't that interesting to watch. Although, if you feel like you're missing out, it looks something like this. Anyway. Uh, in this video, we're going to deal with phases 1 and 2. So that's all the remotely guided stuff. And this is sort of our set up for the manned mission to actually arrive. First up are the satellites, as Drez very quickly approaches there. I actually want to mention again, I have never been to Drez before. Uh, this is the first time I've seen it. This mission was entirely planned based on DV charts and biome maps. I actually don't know what this uh, planet's going to be like. It looks a lot like the moon. Anyway, first thing we need to do is capture around Drez so this doesn't turn into a pit stop. Uh, it's going to take the vast majority of our remaining fuel, but that's okay because after this we're not going anywhere. This is it. We're just setting up a circular orbit right now. That's kind of just for convenience because we have some work to do here. Um, if we want to set up a good satellite constellation, uh, our orbit has to be actually pretty specific. Uh, you know, for one thing, we want it to be flat or zero degrees of inclination or as close as we can get it. Uh, but we also want to set up a pretty specific orbit. Uh, one side of it, we want to be at the target orbit for our satellites, which uh, we're going to use 200 kilometers. But the other end is kind of a weird number, which in this case is 82.0257 kilometers. Uh, and that's because what we're setting up is called a resonant orbit. And what this means is that um, the orbit we're setting has a very specific orbital period that is 25% off from our target orbital period. So like 25% or 75% or 125% in some way off by a quarter. Uh, and that's because we have four satellites. If it was five satellites, then we'd want 20% or 80%, something like that. Now we really need this to be as absolutely precise as we can get. So I'm off by a couple meters and I'm still going to do another couple burns just to really try and get this exactly where I want it. Alright, I guess that's close enough. So the idea here is we are going to release the satellites one at a time. This is going to be kind of a slow process. Uh, I turned the decoupling force down to the minimum because we're going to do this three more times and I don't want it to affect our orbit. Uh, every time we decouple, 
it's going to add a little bit of force to both the satellite and the satellite hub, which makes the, the orbit just a little bit different. Uh, there's, there's not really a good way around that, so we're just going to have to deal with it. Um, it's just kind of slow. Get this satellite all set up, uh, turn on the engines, open up our antenna, and then we wait. So next step is we have to wait until we hit the apoapsis, which is our target altitude. Next step is pretty simple. Uh, when we hit our target altitude, we're just going to circularize. There we go. Oh, I think I'm going to try and be tricky here, but it's not going to work. I think I was trying to be careful so that I wasn't going to accidentally crash into the satellite hub. That's the other downside of minimizing the separation force, is that they don't actually separate very much. And there we go. It's not quite a perfect orbit, but we can uh, we can play with that a little bit later. But for now, this one is in pretty pretty good shape. Now, basically, we're just going to repeat that three more times. Every time we come around, we're going to release another satellite and do the same thing: circularize when it hits apoapse. Because of the resonant orbit, uh, when this satellite comes around to circularize, the first satellite is going to be 90 degrees away in its orbit. I think I'm going to show the map here. Yeah. So you can see the first satellite on the left side there looks, you know, pretty close to exactly a quarter of the way. And once we do all four, there they are. Perfect. So these four satellites, equally spaced, should provide pretty much 100% coverage over the planet's surface. There might be a little bit of a dead zone at each pole, but uh, but not too bad. Now, here's another kind of fun thing. Um, the satellite hub, if we bring it around a fifth time, and everything was perfect. It should actually collide with the first satellite. Right? Let's see what happens here. Okay, this is going to be close. Woo! So, things are not perfect. Uh, like I said, the orbit changed every time we messed uh, with 
a satellite or decoupled. Uh, but we got within 30 meters there. That's pretty good. Now, that didn't actually take uh, all that long, really. I left myself a lot of time before the next phase arrives. Uh, so I think I'm going to off-screen do a little bit of very, very fine maneuvers to try and perfect the orbits. And you can see here, I did pretty good. Almost perfect 200 kilometer circular orbits. Again, not perfect. This will eventually uh, break up the formation and degrade, but uh, I think it's going to stay very functional for a number of years. Just again to visualize this, um, I'm going to turn on the communication lines, and it's a bit of a mess. You can ignore most of them, but what you want to see is that square between the four satellites. We want that square to stay that way, just rotating um, forever, basically. Even though I just said it's not going to stay that way. Still, pretty cool. Now, our little satellite hub here uh, is basically useless. Uh, it's done its job. But uh, it does still have a little bit of fuel left, and it is a little bit of a hazard for maybe colliding with one of those satellites one day. So I've actually come up with one more job for this satellite to do. Not satellite, satellite hub. Uh, it's going to help scout a landing site. Now based on a biome map, I sort of have a spot picked out, just to the north of that dark crater there. But I actually don't know what the, what the terrain is like. Uh, I picked that spot because it's close to the boundaries of a bunch of different biomes so that maybe we can do some extra science. But thankfully this craft has a camera on it, let's say, and uh, we're going to see what it sees. Okay, so it's this crater on the right. We're not going to have long to scout. But I think... That area there, just on the lip... Ooh! That area right next to the crater looks pretty flat, actually. I think that's... Yeah, right there, that's going to work. So uh, this thing's doomed, but I do have some control over it. I was kind of playing around, trying to see if I could do anything fun, and no. It's... It's screwed. But it did its job, so phase one, success. Moving on to phase two, our rover and its uh, deployment pod slash relay base station. Uh, I must have messed something up on this thing's course correction burn because it showed up over the north pole of Drez. Not really sure how I managed that.
This is going to make planning our landing approach a little bit weird. But we also want to wait for our landing site to be in daylight. Because we need our solar panels. It's near that big canyon you can sort of see there just coming into the daylight. So, oh, there it is. That dark crater that our trajectory is now over top. Now, before we head into our landing, we just want to be careful. Um, so I think I'm going to stow the solar panels. It shouldn't be a problem. Uh, Drez doesn't have an atmosphere. We sort of confirmed that with our phase one crash. Um, but you never know. Uh, I should have enough batteries to keep us going until we land, so better safe than sorry. I do have to keep the antenna uh, deployed though, because that's talking to the satellites, which are talking back to mission control on Kerbin. You can see this uh, planet rotates quite fast. I have to plan um, the landing to be quite a bit east of where we actually want it, because by the time we get down there, the planet's going to have rotated underneath us. And I think at this point we've hit our, our point of no return, so we are definitely going to hit the ground. That maneuver node I just put down is um, is really just more for timing. At this point, I'm just going to burn until I start falling straight down. Landings are not my forte in this game, especially trying to be relatively precise in my landing. And ooh, I almost hit that discarded fuel tank coming the other way. This is a really awkward lander. <laughs> I kind of thought this was a cool idea when I was designing it in the in the space center. I'm starting to think maybe it's not the best design.
So just trying to be very careful here. Get my speed down as my terrain altitude gets gets down there. 20 meters and okay, touchdown. Now I did not land where I wanted to. I definitely did not want to be uh, on a hill. I think I wanted to be a little bit more east. But anyway, we're not done with this little lander. It's got a couple tricks up its sleeve. Now I've screwed up here, I have the... there we go. I had SAS on, which was trying to hold my position while I was also attempting to tip it over. And uh, it didn't go so well. But luckily this thing's pretty sturdy and it seems like the gravity on Drez is low enough that I didn't do any serious damage. Now we're going to drop the rover out the bottom. Where is it? There it is. And... Bonk. But still, I'm calling Phase 2 a success at this point. The rover is successfully on the ground, on its wheels, and drivable. Doing a little systems check here. And I guess at this point we're going to close up our, our lander. As I said, this is going to act as sort of a, a relay station on the ground. Um, it, it's honestly not going to do very much. But in the case where our rover or one of our astronauts needs to talk to home, they would go through this up to the satellites and out, just in case their own personal antennas weren't strong enough to reach the satellites. Now let's take this rover for a spin. Uh, rovers, again, are kind of a divisive thing in Kerbal Space Program. Uh, I'll talk about that next video. I don't mean to keep stringing that issue along, but uh, next time it'll make a lot more sense. Uh, but in this case, I do actually have a use for this guy. Uh, our rover is remotely controllable, and it is going to scout a better landing spot for our actual manned lander. We can drive this guy around and uh, we can actually get the game to give us longitude and latitude so that our lander can know exactly where to land. So over there looks okay, but it's getting pretty far away from the, uh, the base station and far away from the crater too. We really want to be more over there. I think maybe I'm just being very careful trying to turn this thing around. Yeah, that's what I'm doing. I'm trying not to go down too steep a hill.
Okay, so this plateau here is really more where I was thinking of landing, even for the rover. But I did kind of mess that up. But, um... Actually, this spot right here looks great. Yeah. Or just a little bit more this way. There we go. So playing around with Kerbal Engineer, uh, that's another mod. It's the one that's specifically giving me all these readouts. Uh, altitudes, times, DV readouts. It's great. Uh, but you can make it give you latitude and longitude, so there we go. 41 degrees south, 33 degrees east. Approximately. Um, yeah, and that's going to be much easier to land the lander with those numbers in mind. Now just scouting a landing spot maybe isn't worth that whole big deployment pod and the rover, but we'll have some more fun with the rover next time. Until then we're gonna just move this thing out of the way of our proposed landing spot and uh, get it all set up so it can wait for its uh, Kerbal Masters, I guess. This rover is a little bit over-designed, I was... <laughs> I didn't know what I was to be expecting here on Drez, so... It's a little goofy. Anyway, uh, that's the end of the video. Thank you guys for watching. See you later.